Hello, Whitefish. August is in full swing, and to be honest, it hasn't seemed particularly angry this year. Just moist. That hasn't stopped the out-of-towners from flocking here, like seagulls to the roof of the O'Shaughnessy. Why are there so many birds up there? Do not forget to get your tickets for the August 29th screening of the award-winning documentary, Bring Them Home. There will be a special performance from Native American hip-hop legend, Superman. You don't want to miss this event. Tickets are available at wackoldcollegecenter.org. Today's guest is Alan Davis. Alan is the president of the Whitefish Community Foundation, which just kicked off its seventh annual Great Fish Challenge, a multi-week fundraising campaign that inspires community-wide giving and builds awareness about the critical work of Flathead Valley nonprofits. The Whitefish Community Foundation awards a percentage match on the first $25,000 raised by each nonprofit. And last year, they helped to raise over $6 million for 77 Flathead Valley nonprofits in just five weeks. Today's episode is brought to you by Thrivers Coffee. If you would like to help support the fight against human trafficking, visit thriverscoffee.com to order your coffee and make a difference today. Alan, thank you so much for coming up on Hello Whitefish today. Yeah. Uh, literally coming down the river. We're like on <laughs> opposite ends of the Whitefish River. True, true. And through a river. Through a river, yep. Um, feels like May. It was raining cats oh. and dogs out there. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I didn't water my garden last night. Right. But that's okay. Yeah, we need it. I always say like a good rainstorm at the end of July is like just what we need to get us through. So yeah. Hopefully the fires behave after this rainstorm. Completely. Yeah. So you are the president of the Whitefish Community Foundation. I am. That is an incredible position to be in because the Whitefish Community Foundation is a home of giving for all things philanthropy in not just Whitefish, but the Flathead Valley. Can you kind of, for the uninitiated, can you tell us what the Whitefish Community Foundation is? Yeah. And thanks for taking a stab at that. At that <laughs> yeah. Answering it. You know, we've... Uh, especially in my new role, I've really been thinking about that question because talking to folks in Whitefish, but also across the whole valley, I'm realizing that there is a disconnect often between uh, people that know who we are and people who maybe have just kind of heard of us. Um, so Whitefish Community Foundation, we are a nonprofit in our own right. Um, and I'd, I'd say one of the things that really distinguishes us um, from other foundations is in our name. It's that word community. Um, and so right now we manage $65 million in assets, and I can get more into that later, but those riches or those dollars are not from one individual. It's not from a corporation. Um, it's really an aggregate of our community voices. And, you know, there's not one person that kind of um, is in charge of that money, like with heavy influence. So we have all these community members that, that give and support Wife's Community Foundation. Um, and our mission is to um, inspire philanthropy in the Flat of Valley and then provide kind of a mechanism so that donors uh, can maybe take advantage of some tax efficient strategies can use their uh, their funds to benefit the nonprofits that are trying hard to improve the quality of life for the Flat of Valley. So that's a very long-winded answer, but uh, we bring donors and nonprofits together to improve the quality of life here in the Flat of Valley. That's so amazing. And the Whitefish Community Foundation has a really cool orig origin story. I was just looking at the Puffalo Cafe's post on Instagram where oh. I think Linda, Linda Metzold had a quote. It was something about the origins of the Whitefish Community Foundation, how like the original group would come into the Buffalo. Yeah. Early morning groups that you see a lot. Like if you grew up uh, in Whitefish and you go to the Buffalo like on Fridays and Thursdays mornings, you always see these groups of people yeah. like deep in conversation. And one of those groups was like the founders of the Whitefish Community Foundation. Yeah, we actually, one of our pictures that we put up all the time is the five founders sitting at the buff, oh. you know, <laughs> just like they really saw the need for there to be an entity that would, um, that would inspire giving, you know, and then also would allow donors to pool their resources for a bigger impact. And I think that's something that kind of sets us aside too, is we bring donor dollars in from the community and because you can kind of leverage that momentum, you can have a much bigger impact 
um, to the nonprofits that serve through matching challenges. Um, just by the nature of there being more money in the fund, you can generate more of an impact that way. So yeah, our founders, they started in 2000. And, and now today we have over 3000 donors that give to us every single year. And last year alone was a record. We granted 13 and a half million dollars out to nonprofits. Um, and the momentum just keeps building. Um, we have a core donor group that's called our circle of giving that really funds all of our grant programs. I would say that's probably how most people know about us, right? Is the big checks that you see in the paper all the time, uh, the money that we're giving out to the nonprofits through the form of our grant programs. So nonprofits in the Flathead Valley and beyond, we can talk about that a little bit, uh, can apply for funding from us. And then our grants committee reviews all those applications, looks at their finances, their board structure, et cetera, and determines that you know it's a good project that we wanna support. Um, and then we cut checks to those uh, organizations in the form of grants. Wow. And I was actually looking at your website earlier and I kind of want the audience to understand what these grants entail. So the grants you give out are like no joke and you guys are very dynamic in not just what you give, but how much you give. So for example, $120,000 grant to affordable housing, $90,000 for kids fund grant for Big Fork Aces, mm -hmm. 520,000 to 68 local nonprofits, workshops for nonprofits. You guys do workshops for nonprofits who are which I know you guys give like a wealth of information so that mm -hmm. people can know what to do. Um, Whitefish Community Grants um, did $50,000 to the Glacier Institute. Yeah. I used to go to camp there as a kid. Oh, nice. I was really excited to see that. And the list really just like goes on and on and on. Yeah. Like those, that's like life-changing money for these nonprofits. It is. It's big, big dollars. And the reason we can do that again is because we're bringing donors together in that circle of giving group. Um, that group gives each each of those circle of giving donors gives $5,000 or more every single year. That money goes into a big pot, and then that pot is distributed out to our grant program. So um, all the grant programs you mentioned are receiving money from that core donor group, and it allows us to really have a huge impact. Um, mm. So the community grant cycle, that's our spring grant cycle, and organizations can apply for up to $10,000 each. And you know that program has really grown in the last couple of years. We expanded it to include Glacier and Lincoln counties oh, great. for health and human services organizations. So your food banks, your youth organizations, uh, health and wellness, that sort of stuff. Um, and so that's grown incredibly. We did 62 organizations in that community grant cycle. And it's really geared towards maybe the smaller nonprofit that needs some startup funding or um, maybe a bigger nonprofit that's got a really special project, right? So 10,000 is the max ask for that. And then the bigger grants that you mentioned, uh, we have a major grants program where kind of our, our board and staff identify projects that are, you know, need an extra boost to get to the finish line. So that grant out to affordable housing was actually to the Northwest Montana Community Land Trust. Okay. They secured four new houses into their inventory uh, in the Trailview neighborhood, which is just... I guess, east of the Whitefish River in Whitefish. Right. Um, so that's an interesting model that where the land trust actually owns the land underneath the houses. It separates it from the title. And then the homeowner comes in and just purchases the house. Oh, okay. They own the house outright. Uh, there's some deed restrictions on there to say it can only increase in X percent value over time. But by taking the land value out of there, it reduces that purchase price significantly and makes it more affordable. Whoa. Permanently. So if that uh, homeowner lives in it for five years, they can still continue to build equity. But again, the, the rate of the increase is kind of capped. Um, so that was a, a great project. Um, and, you know, serving for local residents that are now moving into those houses. So we, we really can, like, be... I guess, versatile in our funding and react to the needs of the community as they pop up. That's amazing that it's a house too. So it's not like an apartment, which are great. We need yeah, those, yeah. but to have those single family homes going to people and we're a small town. So like four homes might not seem like a lot, but that's a huge impact on our community. Yeah. You know, I think all these issues that are popping up, housing's one of the biggest, um, childcare is a big issue. Mm -hmm. They're complex. And, and initially when they pop up, everybody kind of wants like that miracle solution that's gonna build a thousand new units. But the reality is, is we gotta kind of go where the opportunities are uh, mm -hmm. and where the nonprofits are identifying those opportunities, creating those programs, and then how can we come in as a funder to help them actually make it happen? 
That's a really smart approach, being thoughtful and mindful, not just doing these huge developments, which, you know, there are some big developments, but to be able to be like, oh, that's a perfect opportunity there. And just kind of going like at a good pace so it's done right yeah. is great. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of uh, solutions to a lot of these big issues. So Yeah, but they take time. I, they take yeah. time and we're trying to tackle them from all angles, if you will. Yeah. Um, do you guys work with developers directly? Just like, does anyone... Um, like, is there any way for developers to offset their costs if they want to do affordable housing? You know, not yet yeah. in Flathead County. There is a um, statewide housing group called NeighborWorks Montana, mm -hmm. which we can talk about in a minute because we just partnered with them on a project. But they created a revolving loan fund in Bozeman that was $10 million, and it actually allowed private developers to access uh, capital to do specifically affordable rental developments, which was identified by the community. They said, this is our biggest need is just rental units. Um, so private developers can access this money to try to buy down um, the the cost of building so that the rent will be affordable long term. So there are some models out there, but not currently in Flathead County. But you mentioned uh, NeighborWorks, yeah. and you guys did partner with an amazing uh, project. Um, Wife's Community Foundation was a part of a partnership with NeighborWorks to set up a relocation fund for the Spring Creek Mobile Home Park tenants who were recently evicted after new owners took over the property. Can you kind of break, break down what the story is? Yeah, it's a mobile home park in Evergreen, which is a suburb of East Kalispell, you know, and um, and so a new owner purchased the property because they wanted to um, turn a profit on it, either by you know receiving rent or selling it, um, as all kind of investors do. Mm -hmm. um, so through that process, actually, NeighborWorks Montana, I mentioned, is the statewide housing organization. One of their programs is actually to go into mobile home, home parks throughout the state and help those homeowners purchase the park themselves. So they help the homeowners create you know some entity a homeowner association entity that can purchase the park then then they are financing it themselves they're paying themselves back building equity in it etc great model it's been you know tested across the united states so the spring creek mobile home park they were exploring that option and when they got to the place of of uh you know looking into financing well it came back that the mobile homes were in a floodplain and so it didn't qualify for financing so now um the owner of the property was kind of, well, I bought a property that's not currently marketable to someone who's going to be getting a loan to buy it. Um, and so the solution was to raise all the foundations out of the floodplain. And in order to do that, you have to evict everyone. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those tragic uh, stories, I'd say, of maybe increased development pressure, increased property values in the Flathead Valley. Uh, folks are starting to think more and more about investment properties and just putting more and more pressure on um, on homeowners, on property owners, on renters. You know, the whole system's getting a little bit more stressed. So um, they, the mobile home park residents received a an eviction notice. Mm. There were 30 residents there, um, a lot of multifamily residents there. Um, so that made it more complicated. Like, you know, some people said, oh, just go live with your mom. But guess what? Your mom's across the street in the other mobile home and she's getting evicted too so you know entire families were just wondering what was going to happen um <clears throat> so NeighborWorks montana found out about the issue um and that's what they do they help kind of step in during these emergencies to help relocate the families and they realize that every single resident's going to have a unique situation so maybe some will want to leave the flathead maybe some will want to move their mobile home maybe some will want to just get into a different rental um, but it needed to happen pretty quickly. And so they approached us to set up a fund that would accept the donations and kind of take that administrative burden off of their shoulders so that they could really just focus on working with the residents. So, uh, you know, within a week of calling me, I had my executive board approve creating the fund. We waived all of our fees just because that was the right thing to do. Um, and so, you know, the fund opened and then within another week, our grants committee said this is an, an emergency and we have an emergency response fund. So let's let's put in forty five thousand dollars to the fund to seed it uh, and really try to inspire giving and show people that this is serious and and we can get everybody else um, 
to give. Um, and so, you know, within a week, I think we had the fund created with another week, we had a major grant or not a major grant, but a emergency grant uh, dedicated to the project. And then it was in the paper. And so donations just kind of started pouring in. Huh. Um, and happy to report that uh, NeighborWorks Montana has reached the fundraising goal for the residents. The total fund was um, going to be 160000 is what they determined the residents needed. Um, and back to our original mission, Whitefish Community Foundation, I think that's an important thing to tie in here is, you know, we uh, are able to help this nonprofit who's trying to help these folks on the ground. Uh, but the other part of it is inspiring people to give uh, more broadly. And so through the course of receiving those donations, I went to the mailbox one day and opened up the mailbox and there was a $50,000 check in there Wow! for this fund. And wow. it, and it, the, the really, I don't know, inspiring part for me was that it was completely uh, unknown donors we'd never worked with before from outside of Whitefish. And I contacted them. I said, what, you know, what inspired you to give? And they said, well, we just read about it in the paper. We uh, did our homework. We realized that you guys stepped in and you're really providing this service and felt really good about uh, working with Whitefish Community Foundation. So, you know, we inspired that giving and were able to uh, help NeighborWorks Montana in a, in a matter of months. So they're going through the process. I think they've relocated about eight or nine of the families and they have to all be out of there by October. So that's the goal is to really get everybody relocated or, or at least stabilized by October. Oh, that's amazing. So from like finding new trailer park homes or just new places for them to relocate to, is that fun like cover like moving fees and yeah. just making sure they're set up? Yeah. Incredible. And you know, the residents have to go through NeighborWorks Montana. Yep. Um, the aid that we're giving the residents is not direct cash payments. Right. So they've got to go through NeighborWorks Montana. NeighborWorks Montana, let's say a mobile home needs to be moved. They would hire the contractor and then, you know, we would release the money to NeighborWorks to reimburse for that expense. Okay. Yeah. Smart. That's efficient. If, I mean, that kind of money, when people are giving that much money, you want to make sure every dollar is being used Absolutely. in the right way. Yeah, because w another thing, too, is we're realizing donors are sophisticated in their own right. Mm -hmm. And they want to know, especially donors giving $50,000, they want to have the confidence to know that it's going to the right place. So, you know, some of our strategies to ensure that is uh, is reporting. So anytime that we give a grant out to an organization, they have within a year of getting that money to report back to us. How'd you spend it? You know, did you spend it on what you said you were going to spend it? If you didn't, what's your plan? Or are you going to return it to us, which has happened before in the past, too? Um, so for this particular fund, the sideboards we set on it was no cash payments to the individuals. Got to work with NeighborWorks Montana because we felt like that was really important for NeighborWorks to, to play that role. Um, and then if there's any money left over in the fund, let's say, you know, they couldn't expend all that money. Well, then what? Uh, we we're going to restrict that money to helping housing projects in the Flatta Valley. We okay. felt like even though it's a statewide organization, we need to restrict those funds to the Flatta Valley. Oh, that's amazing. And undoubtedly, there's probably going to be more situations like this that come up in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, but, you know, silver lining, potentially, NeighborWorks Montana, separate from our funding, got um, a grant to look at this relocation effort kind of as a case study, if you will. Um, they're going to look at the effectiveness of it over time and hopefully track those residents for a couple of years after just to see like, OK, well, we got them stabilized, but then what? Did it actually work long term? Um, because if we can show that this type of effort is successful, NeighborWorks Montana could consider, you know, creating a statewide fund. Oh, because, um, you know, people are getting evicted out of their single family homes all the time. But we don't hear about it because it's not a headline. Mm -hmm. You hear about the entire mobile home park getting evicted, but you don't hear about the family. And so potentially those single family residents that are getting evicted for this reason, maybe they could access some of this relocation money if we can show that it's effective. So that's a really cool part of it um, that we're going to get some data back to see if it, if it worked. Hey friends, I want to take less than a minute to tell you about an awesome product I use called Go Pills by a company called Military Nootropics. Go Pills are a blend of eight nootropic neurochargers that support focus, clarity, attention, fast recall, and decision making. These have actually been tested by some of the US military's top special operators who have given rave reviews to Go Pills. And I wouldn't be promoting this awesome company if I didn't believe in this product myself. You can get 15% off your order when you use the code HELLO15 at checkout when you visit gopills.com. 
Now back to the interview. I wonder if because Montana is a relatively small population, it makes it easier to kind of do these sort of things. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah, could be. So like community housing, affordable housing, these sort of emergency funds. What are some other areas of Philanthropy Wife's Community Foundation focuses on? Is it kind of anything or is there kind of like a tenet of things you focus on? We have some focus areas. Um, and one of them you mentioned, the our Kids Fund, that was created back in 2019 to really address this kind of scary problem we have here with youth homelessness that was identified in 2019. You know, working with our youth organizations and some of the stats coming from uh, land to hand uh, from our school districts to know how many of their student body are struggling with homelessness. And it, you know, homelessness doesn't mean they're living outside. It could mean unstable housing. Maybe a student is living at aunt and uncle's houses or couch surfing on a friend's house. That's a homeless individual because it's not a stable resident. Um, and that can create just a lot of stresses on, you know, development, upbringing, et cetera. So uh, we launched uh, the Kids Fund back in 2019, and it really is is pumping bigger grants up to $150,000 into programs that are really trying to get at that issue, youth homelessness. So we funded... Um, but you mentioned Big Fork Aces. They're an after-school program that we're looking to expand into middle school population. Um, more recently, the Center for Restorative Youth Justice, CryJ, mm -hmm. we gave them, oh, geez, 120000 I think, wow. over, over three years. Yeah. Um, but they really wanted to go upstream from their normal uh, referrals that they get come from the justice system. So if a kid gets arrested, um, goes to court, that judge will say, okay, instead of going to juvenile detention center, you go to the Center for Restorative Youth Justice through their program, it'll satisfy that requirement. And the goal is to have <clears throat> a, a very low recidivism rate where they won't reoffend. And CryJ is, I think they say it's a 90% success rate of, of kids going through their program. Wow. So they've historically been, you know, getting kids uh, referred by youth court. But they decided, well, really, if we can go upstream to the schools and try to interact with the students, maybe when they have an altercation at school, it's not elevated to the police yet, but it could be. Uh, let's, let's do some intervention there and see if that's gonna have an impact. So that was an example of a Kids Fund grant. We helped them get that off the ground, hire a staff member to do it, et cetera. Oh, that is so smart to be able to do that at that level. Yeah. I know they have some great volunteer programs. I'm a good friend, Earl Reynolds, who's been a guest on the show. He does a lot of volunteer work there too. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, that's such a great organization. It is. Yeah. It is. So the Kids Fund is one of our, our focused grant programs trying to address a specific issue. Uh, but the biggest grant program that everybody knows about is the Great Fish Community Challenge. Yes. Um, and that's coming up. It is. Next Thursday, August 8th. Eighth, it is launching, and this is the tenth year of the Great Fish Challenge. And wow! Over the last eighteen months, having this job, I have spoken to a lot of groups, and particularly the ones outside of Whitefish. I'll say, "Has anybody heard of Whitefish Community Foundation?" Raise a hand, and maybe half the room goes up. And then you say, "Who's heard of the Great Fish Community Challenge?" You know, and the whole room goes up. So, you know, there's often a, a disconnect to realize that Whitefish Community Foundation hosts the whole thing, pays for the whole thing, yeah. raises the match pool, which is the whole basis of the challenge. Um, so we're pretty excited. We're kicking it off next week. And yeah. hopefully, hopefully we're going to break last year's fundraising record. Which was, what was the record last year? We raised um, 77 nonprofits participated, okay. all local Flathead Valley organizations. And we had um, 6.2 million was raised in five weeks. What? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, over 3,000 donors, 11,000 donations. It's, it's kind of incredible. And um, I guess just to take a step back to describe it, you right? Because what is it? Yeah, what is it? Like, how did it come about? Whose idea, brilliant idea was this? It was my predecessor, yeah. Lin Linda Ng Grady. She's the past president and CEO of the foundation. It started 10 years ago. And I think Linda really looked at other community foundations in the country what are they doing? What kind of interesting things and cutting edge programs do they have? And uh, the Jackson Hole Community Foundation in Wyoming had this fundraising campaign that had been going on for uh, 20 years. And it's it's very similarly structured where the community foundation raises a match pool and then nonprofits are participating in the challenge. And if they raise a certain amount, get access to a match from the community foundation. 
Mm. So it's it's kind of a beautiful model in that um, you know we're putting up a million dollars hopefully this year in matching funds, and then all the nonprofits that participate are raising money from their donors to try to leverage the match. Um, and so over the course of the five week campaign, what happens from a donor perspective is that uh, it's really convenient and easy because you can make one gift in the challenge. Let's say. Uh, 200 bucks, and then you want to give $40 to, you know, five different organizations. Well, it's one gift. It's with a credit card. It's one transaction. It's one tax receipt. So at the end of the year, you don't have to kind of, you know, go through and, oh, geez, where did I put that tax receipt from that donation? It's all in one place. Oh, that's Uh, great. It's really efficient. Mm -hmm. And from the nonprofit perspective, that's that's what we want. We want everybody to kind of go all in because we realize if we all work hard together, we are all that much more successful because if 80 different nonprofits were out there in the summer doing their own little fundraising campaign, you'd have donor fatigue, you'd have donor um, confusion. And now it's like, let's get everybody to the table. We're all in for this one five week campaign and donors can go through and learn about new groups uh, and make one gift to support, you know, the entire community. Oh, that's really smart. Yeah, it's been great. And that's why it's been so successful is people are, um, they get it now. They, they're holding their gifts until the middle of summer to give during the challenge. A, because they want to get that multiplier effect with our match, right? You give a hundred bucks, we're going to give a percentage match on that at the end of the campaign. Um, but then B, it's just this beautiful, um, sense of teamwork that we're all working together nonprofits are coming together and um and like i said we're all going to be more successful it makes raising money as a nonprofit which is arguably the most difficult part of running a nonprofit probably a lot more enjoyable and a lot um kind of gives the nonprofits practice it to does. know that is there's going to be a structure that's going to give you money if you put in the work yeah and it's it's an anchor to a lot of organizations fundraising um plans for the whole year is just they can count on it you know and they do have to apply every single year i want to make that clear is we all the nonprofits participating in the challenge have gone through a formal application process with us so they've been vetted you know by our grants committee we've looked at their financials and their their board composition and their program statements and all that so we feel confident in all the participants in the challenge um and you're right. It, it is just a, an, an amazing way for the community to support the nonprofits, because one of the cool things that happens is, um, let's say you get on there and you're like, OK, I want to support Cry J and I want to support the Nate Shoot Foundation. Uh, but maybe you learn about something you didn't know existed. Uh, this year, we have five new organizations participating that have never participated. And maybe you'll make a gift to one of those. Oh, awesome. So from their standpoint, they're like, well, who's Morgan Delaney? Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is a new donor. Right. Uh, I need to you know, tell him thank you for giving and then hopefully develop a relationship and grow the donor base that way. So there's this kind of organic growth of new donors that happens by participating in the challenge. Challenge. And we know that the average donor gives to four different groups in the challenge. And that's really that's really the point is like, come to the challenge, learn about what's happening in the nonprofit community, and then figure out, you know, where you're going to give. What's the uh, geographic boundary for the nonprofits that are eligible? Flathead County. There are, of course, there's like nuances, right? We've got statewide organizations that might have a Flathead County chapter. Montana Conservation Corps is a great example. You know, they've got an office here with staff. They've got uh, local board representation on their statewide board. And one of the sideboards on the challenge is all the funds raised has to be spent in Flathead County on Flathead County programs benefiting Flathead County residents. Another example is the. Um, Montana Youth Diabetes Alliance, they have this amazing camp that brings kids from all over the country here, you know, to have this uh, amazing camp where bring kids with type 1 diabetes together um, for programming, for uh, treatment, etc. And so they are participating in the challenge. And it's like, well, wait, I don't want to raise money from Flathead Valley donors to bring a kid from maybe across the country here, even sure. though that's a that's a valuable experience for that kid. But what they're going to do is is uh, restrict that money to say, OK, now we have a pot of money so that we can have Flathead Valley kids attend the camp. You know? Oh, OK. Yeah. So yep. so that's the sideboards on the money raised is it's got to stay in Flathead County to benefit Flathead County residents. 
Jeez, that is incredible. So in your experience, what do you think makes a good nonprofit successful? Like, so say there's someone out here listening to this, some of these new nonprofits that are yeah. on board. What have, what have you learned that's like, this is what makes a good nonprofit? Right. Um, a strong board of directors. Very, very important. And it's not just strong people on the board. You have to have strong governance. And what does that mean to the to the listener out there. It's like, well, you need to have board policies in place. You need to be, you know, doing your strategic planning every three years, looking ahead. You need to be doing uh, budgeting every year. It's amazing how many nonprofits we get applications from that aren't budgeting. It's like, well, how do you know what your goals are and what the needs are and how are you reacting to those over time? Um, so it kind of all starts with board governance to really set the policies in place that the organization is going to follow, uh, both from a program standpoint, but also from a staff standpoint. Right. Um, and and then it's it's good. Um, policies you know kind of underneath that board governance are do you have a financial policy do you have uh, an investment policy or an hr policy you know really getting your ducks in a row early and setting up that structure will have you know huge returns five to ten years down the road because otherwise boards turn over a lot right you know they have to they have to to be uh, successful. A lot of the really successful boards have uh, term limits. So you reach that term and you're out, you know, you need some fresh blood in here. Uh, but sometimes turnover happens a little too quickly, right? There's nonprofits where maybe the parents of the participants are the board. And when the kids kind of leave the daycare or leave the uh, sporting group, they're off the board. And so you have this constant revolving door. And if you don't have that board governance that's, that's tying it all together, then it's just kind of waffling around, you know? So I would say that's one of the most important things. I feel like this has got to be a great area to be in for an, if you are a nonprofit, because it just seems like there's just so much support for the nonprofit community here. It's kind of really remarkable. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, take some credit for that yeah you should you, know? you guys should <laughs> because aside from the um the funding you know everybody reads all the big check photos or sees them in the paper but we have a nonprofit development program that helps boards and staff and organizations figure it out we've got um a program we're launching right now where uh, nonprofits can apply for up to two thousand dollars to do strategic planning we'll We'll hook them up with a consultant. They have to go through the process and, you know, be fully in, in, on board with it. But um, we have monthly workshops where we talk about, uh, you know, finances, fundraising. Um, we even did one um, this spring called HR Do's and Don'ts of Nonprofits. You know, it's like, well, yeah, nonprofits are businesses. Right. And a lot of people get into the nonprofit world and think, oh, we can just kind of shoot from the hip here. But it's like, no, you have an employee and you have things that you need to think about, you know, from that standpoint, from an HR standpoint. So um, we really see ourselves as a resource and we hope that all the nonprofits we work with um, will call us. You know, we're always available to give insight training um, on everything they're working on. That is so important because it is very complex. I think if you do come from a business standpoint, understanding that there is an ownership in a nonprofit, I think it's kind of can be kind of hard to wrap your head around. Right. I think I was just reading. Uh, I think this happened under Trump when he signed this tax bill. I don't know if you heard about this provision. I think it was when Paul Newman died. Um, he wanted to gift his Paul Newman foods to the Paul Newman Foundation, but you legally couldn't. Mm. But I guess like a tax law was passed that allows an L. LLC to be gifted to a nonprofit. Are you familiar with this? Not really. Okay, I forget. I think it was a kind of thing that slid under the radar, but I think it was based on Paul Newman wanting his foundation to get like the profits from his very successful oh, dr food dressing. Right. And but that was like traditionally illegal under like IRS tax code, okay. but I think there's a provision that allows an LLC to be gifted to a nonprofit. Okay. Is Patagonia doing something similar? I believe so. I read I, so. I read about that in the headlines too. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of um, IRS regulations, tax incentives, disincentives to, to help nonprofits. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, the nonprofit industry started because the government realized that groups could really serve their communities in a better way, uh, potentially. And so we're willing to give up tax revenue for people just to give money directly to those programs. Mm. That's the birth story of nonprofits. And so that still exists today. 
And, and we have a lot of tools to help donors with their charitable giving, um, not only to simplify their giving, but from a tax standpoint as well, is, you know, some donations are eligible to receive a tax, uh, federal tax deduction. Some donations are eligible to receive uh, different types of credits. Like in Montana, we have this kind of unheard of tax credit where if a donor gives a qualified gift to a qualified endowment. It's like, well, what's qualified? I can talk about that. In okay, minute. they can get um, a tax credit for forty percent the value of the gift, up to thirty thousand dollars per couple, and it's a credit. So just yeah. distinction there, straight straight off top of the tax bill, um, and so the money for that credit has to go into a, a qualified endowment. And an endowment is a restricted fund where the principal is restricted and it just peels off interest to support a nonprofit every single year. Is that different than a donor advised fund? It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that's another one of our roles. And it's actually in our mission statement is to grow endowments. But we hold over 40 endowments for other nonprofits. Oh, incredible. So the food bank, North Valley Food Bank, they have an endowment with us. And we invest those money, those monies in the stock market to receive, uh, you know, investment growth. Mm -hmm. And then every year we provide North Valley Food Bank um, a distribution that they can count on every single year. And our investment policy is such such that um, you know that distribution is based on a, a five-year average of the balance, mm -hmm. and so it really kind of tempers out the fluctuations in the market, so that they can depend on that every single year when they're doing their budgeting. They can say, okay, we know that the the endowment distribution is going to be X for next year, and they can plan for it that way. Is it more of like a broad investment strategy in the market? Like you're like, I'm just going to invest in Google, or is it oh, more yeah. of like, yeah? We have we have like the best financial advisor in the country, and okay. <laughs> you know they are they work specifically with community foundations, and we're not we're not in private equities. I yep. mean a little bit, but there's too much volatility there. So if you look at our financial returns, they're a lot more moderated than maybe you could get with a private investor. But again, community foundations are around forever, and mm -hmm. these funds have to be invested forever to preserve that capital so that it can keep having a, a benefit to the, um, the designated beneficiary. Um, so that tax credit got off track there a little bit. It's just incredible. Um, and when I describe it to folks, they're like, how is that possible? You know, that I'm going to get a $30,000 tax credit on my state income taxes. So yeah, you, you know, largely it's Montana residents that are taking advantage of it. Um, and you know that's a big tax bill to the state. If you have to pay thirty thousand dollars in tax, you have to have the income to support it. Mm -hmm. But um, so we've got tools in the toolbox to maybe help a donor accomplish you know their charitable goals, but then also maybe receive a tax benefit on the side too. What kind of gifts um, are these gifts? Like if I wanted to get that tax credit, the max credit would be about an eighty thousand dollar donation. Okay. Yep. Just 80, straight off the board. Eighty thousand dollars. Forty percent of that's thirty grand. You know, roughly. Yeah. And and it's pretty complicated because state law requires it to be set up as a deferred gift annuity, okay. which is a complicated word. But um, it basically means we enter into an agreement with the donor and we hold that money for five years with a very set term. And then at the end of the five years, it can release into the endowment of, of choose, the donor's choosing. Um, and that's under state law, too. Hmm. They changed it because when they first launched this program, it was kind of outright gifts. It's like, yeah, make a donation to endowment, then you get a tax credit. Well, participation in the program like blew through the roof. And the state was like, wait a minute, we're giving up too much tax revenue. We need to make this a little bit more complicated. And what they didn't want to happen is they didn't want donors to start pivoting away from giving you know, general unrestricted operating dollars to now giving to nonprofits, or sorry, now giving to endowments. So they made this shift to make it a little more complicated with these deferred gift annuities. And then what they saw is participation declined. Mm. So it's it's still meaningful. Last year, we processed 700,000 um, tax credit gifts through Whitefish Community Foundation. And one of the coolest things I think is is that all of those gifts, our endowment was not named as a beneficiary. It was all other endowments of, of other nonprofits. Oh, wow. Um, so, so really, you know, that's our role that we play is kind of like a bank, if you will. Sure. You know, a nonprofit bank, but we're, <clears throat> we're receiving, um, instead of deposits, donations uh, from donors, and then we're able to invest that money in the stock market under IRS rules, um, receive tax-free growth, either for a nonprofit or for a donor. Mm -hmm. And then we distribute the money instead of loans, we give it out as grants. It's like, you huh. know, it's very elementary 
kind of view of what we do, but a good analogy. That works. Yeah. The next generation is there's this turnover of wealth that's eventually going to get passed. And we were just talking about it. Can you talk about what that number is? Well, you know, <clears throat> like eventually, like a lot of the next generation is going to inherit a lot of money from the older generation. Yes. And I heard a stat and don't quote me on this. Sure. 85 trillion is what I heard. Insane. Baby boomers are going to pass on to the next generation. Um, and, you know, I'm hearing it from a lot of donors is like, gosh, they work too hard. They save, save too much money. Their kids don't need it anymore. Um, um, and so they're approaching us often to say, what are my options to, to help the community, you know, from a, a nonprofit or charitable standpoint? Um, and so that's another thing that we offer donors is to work with them in their estate planning to say, OK, you know, you've identified that you want to give away 20 percent of your estate to nonprofits, well, we can actually help with that transaction. You know, we set up some paperwork, identify what the donor wants us to do with that money, and then they identify Whitefish Community Foundation and their specific legacy fund as a beneficiary in their will or estate planning documents. And then when they pass away, we get the money, and then we basically follow the instructions that they left behind to say, okay, I want it to go out to you know, these five organizations, I want it to be permanently invested in an endowment or, you know, it's kind of sky's the limit. So yeah, um, <clears throat> that is a growing part of our business is working with folks in their estate planning to, to just, you know, figure out what, what they want to support long after they're gone. Man, you said something so kind of mind blowing. It's like the idea that this generation worked too hard and saved too much money yeah. <laughs> that their kids don't need. I like, think it's true on some <laughs> level, Yeah, you know, or, um, I don't know what it is. It's like if you own, if you worked your whole career in Whitefish and you owned a house here and you're going to pass that house on to your kids, it's like, well, wow. Yeah. That's a big asset. Right. You know, and what are the tax implications for that? Um, and particularly these, these individual retirement accounts, IRAs, mm -hmm. um, there's some interesting opportunities for donors to give money directly from their IRA um, because it would avoid any taxes. So a traditional IRA is a retirement account where you can put money in and it's a deferred tax account. So you don't pay taxes on the money when you put into it. It grows tax free. But guess what? When you retire and you take that money out in retirement, it becomes income. And so you have to pay income tax on it at that point. Uh, um, right. And the IRS also says, well, um, they're going to require you to take a distribution from it every single year, and it's based on life expectancy. So they look at the balance, and they tell you, you have to take this number out of your retirement account this year. And so a lot of retirees maybe are on a fixed income with a pension. Uh, they don't need that money, and they don't want it to hit their income because mm -hmm. it'll bump them into the next tax bracket. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tool the IRS allows where they can make a donation directly from their IRA account to a nonprofit and it avoids uh, hitting their books as income altogether. Oh, um, so okay. it's really tax efficient for them. And, and we're seeing that as a, as a growing part of, of charitable giving with the foundation. And I'm sure it's happening nationally. That's great. It is good. You know, and it's nice that they have the tools right. to be able to do it. It's nice. The government is allowing that. There's limits to it, but that's pretty good. Yeah, there's a lot of countries that that kind of stuff does not happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, truth. As far as like the next generation, are you seeing trends in like what the younger generations, you know, the from teens to the twenties, the thirties, how the younger generations are participating, whether if it's like grassroots, small donations, people just organizing stuff, versus how older generations have traditionally fundraised or donated. Right. Is the community foundation seeing any interesting trends there? That's an interesting question. I mean, I guess it's kind of hard because like so much of the fundraising we do or that happens here is like supposed so specific to the area. Right. I'm sure it's completely different that you'd seen like L.A. or New York or. Yeah, I mean, else. We're, we're definitely catered towards, I would say, the older crowd. Sure. Um, not all of our donors necessarily. And even we're seeing a growing segment of our circle of giving donors. Those are our biggest donors that are, you know, in their 30s and, and want to give back to the community. Um, but by and large, you know, we're working with folks who have worked in their careers for 40 years and have disposable income. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say on the nonprofit side, there are some creative ideas. You were just talking about one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before we started. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen peer to peer fundraising strategies anywhere from like, yeah, go on a bike ride and I'm going to raise a dollar for every mile I ride that kind of strategy. Um, 
live auctions are, are pretty fun and they're also growing silent auctions. Um, gosh, there's so many different ways to raise money out in the world but so i would say yes there yeah. are there are starting to be some new creative ideas and a lot of that is being driven by younger individuals who maybe are just have access to more different technology and different software and different um, sources of inspiration it's like how how can we leverage dollars um, because i think philanthropy like the idea that i'm just going to give you a hundred dollars and i don't get anything in return yeah that is a little bit antiquated on some level. And I, I would right. say maybe this younger generation, they want something in return for that. Right. And maybe it's an experience. You know, yep. It can't be a, a tangible benefit because then it's not a donation under IRS rules. But maybe they want an experience out of it. You know, go to a concert, mm -hmm. you know, or I will uh, participate in this event where there's a beer garden or, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe it's more experience driven for the younger groups. Oh, I totally think it is. That's part of the reason why I'm doing this event at the Wackolds College Center at the end of August. Shout out uh, for this documentary I worked on called Bring Them Home. And when I was looking at venues, I was looking at the Performing Arts Center, O'Shaughnessy, and I'm like, well, let's look at the Wackold Center. It's kind of like the Walt Disney Hall of the Flathead Valley. It's amazing. It's amazing. And what it turns out that if you're doing a fundraiser or you're a nonprofit doing an event, you get a significant discount <laughs> yeah. on the rental fee for the venue. So there I'm like, go. well, I'm just going to turn this into a fundraiser for you know one of my favorite numbers profits deliver fun nice cut down on the cost of it make yeah. it more of an experience yep. and that way people are buying tickets and knowing that their money is going towards exactly. a nonprofit. yeah and then you've got like on the other end of the spectrum shout out to liz Poole who organized the jello wrestling the sock wrestling that's event. what i was referencing earlier like this incredible experience that like i think on the surface if you're familiar with this event it's like sock wrestling and a raffle full of jello people look like they just got off the mad max movie set it's like really crazy but when you get to the heart and soul of it it's such a community event. Cody Hoon and E-Rock are her the MCs are like constantly pumping that this is a community event. We're here to support the amazing nonprofit Cry J. Everyone's here to have a good time. Yeah. And a lot of the people that come to like something like that, it's such more of a niche subculture of Montana culture. Yeah. But such an important way to bring different aspects of the community together. Right. Which is just so important and so just like inspiring. Yeah. And you know, I had a comment recently from a younger donor who who almost felt helpless and yeah like how can i have an impact if i'm just giving 100 bucks or 25 dollars um particularly through the greatest challenge because it 6.2 million is such a big number um and how, how can you really feel like you're making an impact there um we have figured that out on some level we offer incentive grants during the challenge to nonprofits that you know do certain things. And so the biggest incentive grant this year, which is huge for our 10th anniversary, we're doing five $10,000 incentive grants, one per week. The nonprofit that gets the most number of donations will get that $10,000. Oh. So as a $25 donor, you could very well push that nonprofit over the edge to get them 10,000, you know? Um, and what we looked at the data, uh, the 11,000 gifts that came through the, the challenge last year, the median donation for all those was a $100 gift. Mm -hmm. So again, not the average, much different statistic, but the median is the middle mark of the numbers, but the bulk of the numbers are 100 and below. I mean, that's kind of inspiring on that level, and it really shows that we've got this broad base of community support. We've got the, the voices of our community that are putting their dollars where they want to support. And, um, and so, you know, I would just say as a young donor, uh, maybe it does feel hopeless against the billionaires of the world, but, mm -hmm. but in the Flathead Valley, there's grassroots projects and programs that, that need help. Oh, that is such a great, great mechanism yeah. to acknowledge those donors and those small donations and make it an impactful way. That's such a cool, cool thing to do. Yeah. We're excited. It's going to probably drive us crazy in the back office, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll see. We'll oh. see this year. We're excited about a big number, hopefully. So the Greyfish Challenge runs for five weeks. Yep. It launches August 8th um, at Three Rivers Bank here in Whitefish. We're going to have a big party, big tent, music, um, drinks, and food. And that's honestly one of the best events of the whole challenge just because there's there's no format it's just like come and socialize with all the groups that are there 80 nonprofits will be there you can come see who's connected to who and and learn what these groups are doing and um and they're much more relaxed than nonprofits because they don't have to have a booth up you know it's just a party so it launches on um 
on the 8th, and of course we're doing incentive grants at the party. If uh, an organization gets a donation for $100 or more, they'll be entered into a drawing to win 1000 bucks. Hmm. And we're going to do 10 of those to make 10000 And then throughout the challenge, we have pop-up donation stations throughout the valley. I mean, from Columbia Falls, Big Fork, uh, Kalispell, Whitefish, of course. And um, and those are, you know, more outreach events, literally on street corners with the signs. You know, the the people that were pushing the mattress stores, you know, with the, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, co- we copied that mechanism. It seemed to at least, you know, turn some heads in cars. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you'll be seeing those around the valley throughout the campaign. And then we have the this awesome community fair, which is on September 7th this year. All the nonprofits are going to be in Depot Park in Whitefish, all 80 of them, and they're all going to have booths up. And so we really want the community to come and learn about what they're doing and see how maybe you want to get involved as a volunteer. Maybe you want to make another donation. Um, and so that's paired with a 5K and one mile run that we have uh, on the river trail up to City Beach and back. So it's a really fun event. Um, it's a good way to kind of end the challenge and, and one final reminder for people to donate. Um, it it ends on September 13th, and then we're going to have the award ceremony on October 22nd at the Walkout Center. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even if you are not involved with a nonprofit or donated, I think you should come because it's just an inspiring evening. You know, yeah. we're going to give away, hopefully, over $7 million. Um, and grants that night, all the nonprofits will be there. And, you know, it really makes you feel like proud, you know, to be a part of this community. That's cool. Um, God, I'm just shout out to the Walkold Center for everything they do. Yeah, it's it's just an amazing facility. I mean, shout out to, is it Charles Walkolds? I can't remember the guy's Paul. name. Paul. Paul. And also Al, Al Stinson. Oh, yeah, Stinson family. Yep. Yeah, Hall, the Hollensteiners, uh, the Smith family. There's a lot of folks that just stepped up to the plate to make that place happen. Oh, it's such a beautiful venue. Yep. I know. I'm so excited to do an event there. It's just so cool like how accessible that place is and the team running that place is really supportive. Kind of the biggest event I've ever thrown and it's just they've just made it so less intimidating and seamless and they're yeah. just really just so great there. Good support system. Yeah. Yep. So lucky to have all this in the flathead. I mean, I grew up here in Whitefish and I mean, Whitefish has always been so tight knit and I feel like this is a culmination of years and generations and people like Linda Metzold and Linda Grady and mm-hmm. um, all these amazing people People just really growing up an incredible garden, if you will, of yeah. community giving. I mean, you look at all the assets that we have, not just in Whitefish, but across the whole valley. In Whitefish, just to talk about them, it's like the dog park, the Whitefish Trail, uh, the Wave, the O'Shaughnessy Center, the library, um, Stumptown Ice Den. The I skate mean, park. The skate park. Biggest skate park in Montana. There you go. Yeah. I mean, the list is is so long, and all of those projects were driven by local private philanthropy. Great partnerships with the city, county, with, with uh, other groups, but ultimately spearheaded by charitable giving. And Whitefish Community Foundation has been kind of the consistent force throughout all those projects over the course of the last 25 years. That's so incredible. And I think this is a good point to talk about um, something that people has seen as kind of a negative, and it kind of has been the inflow of new people moving, not just to Montana, but the Flathead Valley. How has that impacted um, the Wife's Community Foundation and philanthropy? Have you seen an influx of donors that have kind of matched the inflow of people moving here? You know, hard to say if it's like equal keeping up. Um, I did see a study from Fidelity Charitable, which is kind of Fidelity Investments, it's their uh, nonprofit arm. Uh, they really looked at which states where there's an imbalance of giving versus um, the the need, if you will, or or the wealth. I guess okay is does the giving match up with the wealth? And Montana was one of those states that was identified as no, it is not. Actually, per capita, Montana gives less than. Washington or California or New York, you know, and uh, that trend is just kind of uh, there nationwide is that the coastal communities give more per capita than than the interior of the United States. And so it's hard to say here what the the hyper local trend is. But I would say anecdotally, absolutely. We're getting new donors all the time from people that move here uh, and look us up. Maybe they've worked with the community foundation in their uh, home state or, or wherever they're from. And so they look us up and they want to 
give a donation. Um, and so I would say it is not unusual for us to get a five or ten thousand dollar gift completely unsolicited from somebody we've never heard of <laughs> who just moved here. And how do we do that? How do you kind of get at that population that's just moved here? I think when you move to a new community, there's just an eagerness to get involved and yeah. an eagerness to get connected. Um, because ultimately, that's why they're moving here is because we're such an, an authentic community. They want to be a part of that energy. Um, and so you know, donating and starting at the nonprofit level is a good place for someone to get engaged. Maybe they start out volunteering and then become a donor, that kind of progression. But um, so we're hoping that this year's greatest challenge is the biggest we've ever had in part because yeah, there's more people here. Amazing. Yeah. And you guys are trying to to break seven million. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, Lucky number seven. Yeah. It'd be awesome to break 10 in year 10, but that's probably not going to happen. You never know. You never know. <laughs> Somebody surprised me out there. Yeah. I we'll mean, the see. dollar could keep deflating or inflating and it just gets to the point where it says that's what it's worth. Right. Yeah. Right. That brings me to my next question. Do you guys accept Bitcoin <laughs> for donations? You know, this came up recently. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> not yet. It is a growing sector of the community foundation space. So we're a part of the Council on Foundations, which is kind of our uh, parent organization. And they are on Capitol Hill. Um, and so every community foundation in the country kind of is underneath them. And they're our governing organization. And so they're sending out information all the time. It's right. like, so there was a report that came out as like, um, yeah, I, I don't know what the stat is, but there's a growing sector of community foundations that are accepting Bitcoin charitably. It's legal in the United States to do that. The IRS allows it. It's just a matter of, you know, are we going to step in and, and do that ourselves? One of the short term solutions is you work with an intermediary. So there's these other nonprofits that have popped up to basically do that transaction and then and then the money. But, oh. you know, now that it's trading publicly in ETFs, <laughs> You know, I don't see why it would be a problem for us. Um, but, you know, take that with a grain of salt because right. <laughs> I'm not the decision maker. The The people on our investment committee are the best at their jobs in the country. And so they, um, they'll they have the final say. But I could see that's the trend is like in the next yeah. five or 10 years, if we're asked by somebody, then yeah. I could see that happening, but like here's a here's a hard drive with the passphrase, and this got because it's an asset essentially. So can a foundation essentially hold an asset like real estate or gold or something like that? It's totally up to that foundation's okay. uh, policy. We have a policy that if if we accept gifts of stock, which we do regularly, like almost weekly, um, we sell that stock immediately because we do not hold private equities. There's just too much risk of volatility. Right. Um, and you know if a donor gives you a hundred thousand dollars in stock on day one while well, somebody messes up and it's all over the headlines and that stock tumbles 20 percent the next day oh. you know that's where we really get into trouble and we do some pretty big gifts you know a hundred thousand dollar gifts of stock could could degrade in value by twenty thousand dollars overnight so that's not our business but we do accept stock and then we just sell it immediately when it hits our account so oh, that's good i think it would be something similar with bitcoin is we would not we would not hold bitcoin yep we would accept sell liquidate and then you know take the cash that's smart. Yeah. This is so interesting to learn about this, everything the Community Foundation does, because I've known about it since the inception, but I've yeah. never known exactly how it's gotten to the point where it's at. If you look at that growth, I think it's, it's, it is unprecedented for a community of this size. Yeah, right? 10,000 people. We were started in 2000, and um, next year, it's looking like we're going to break a pretty big milestone of 100 million granted out the door. And so in 25 years, we'll have granted $100 million. What? Um, insane. Th that's insane. And then our assets, as I talked earlier, we currently manage $65 million in assets. And so that asset growth from, from zero to 25 is pretty substantial um, in its own right. And so, you know, the trajectory is we'll, we'll be at $100 million in five years. But um, hopefully the, the trend continues that way. But... It is pretty remarkable, and yeah. I think it's a testament to uh, our founders. It's a testament to our board of directors, really, to look at the most successful community foundations in the country, Jackson Hole, Silicon Valley. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. I mean, down to the nitty gritty details of what's their back end software. Oh, we, right. We want that. Right. So we've got the best software in the country that you could buy. It's expensive, $30,000 a year. But what it does from a function standpoint on our back end and managing all the funds and all the money that we have, I mean, it's just uh, it's improved our efficiency and our sophistication because we're getting donors from 
you know, all over the country that have second homes here that expect some level of sophistication and professionalism. And so we have always kept that standard. Um, and so I think that's a testament to our growth too. So how can people get involved if they want to donate, if they want to get in touch with you about a large donation, community foundation? Yeah, we're easy to find. Yeah. We're on West 2nd Street, um, just west of downtown Whitefish. We have a website. Imagine yep. that. Whitefishcommunityfoundation.org. <laughs> um, I would say the best way to get involved is to make a donation through the Great Fish Community Challenge, which starts next Thursday. Um, and again, how that works is I, literally, me, my board, are raising the match pool. This year, it's going to break a million bucks, hopefully. Not Nonprofits are leveraging that match. So when you make a gift to Whitefish Legacy Partners to support the Whitefish Trail, $100, they get 100% of that gift. And then at the end of the challenge, we match those gifts from that match pool. Um, and so even as a $100 donor, you can really help these organizations reach that milestone and get that match. Um, so it's a great way to start um, getting involved with the community is just to support the nonprofit that's impacting your life directly. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Alan, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank this you. has been a great episode. Yeah, so. I appreciate the, the opportunity, and I love what you're doing here. I think oh, it's just great. Thank you. So you can really, um, you know, bring to light a lot of the voices that you wouldn't have maybe exposure to, you right. know, as just a regular citizen. So thank you for that. Totally. I basically just was like, I need to take the conversations that I have at the palace and <laughs> bring them into a studio yeah. for the day to light to see. So. Okay. So I need to come to the palace if I want to talk to you. You know, when I became a father, I stopped going to the palace as much. True. As much. <laughs> True. Awesome. Alan, thank yeah. you so much. Thank have a good you. one. And thank we'll see you. you at the Greatest Challenge. Sounds great. Awesome. <laughs>